Hello and welcome to Foreign Policy Focus. This is episode 120 and I'm the show's host, Kyle. Foreign Policy Focus is the podcast where I discuss current events related to foreign policy and international news and then get some analysis on the events. The show uh, comes out every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. On this podcast, I'm really going to be focusing on Yemen and then that 60 Minutes piece that came out last night. I feel like it's really significant. Really, the only mainstream story to talk about when it came to Yemen was that it really wasn't talked about in the mainstream media. And so to last night's uh, big deal on Citizen Minutes was probably the first time this conflict has really been put in the face of a lot of American citizens. So if you feel like me that the war in Yemen is really important and what the United States is doing there is really participating in at least what's approaching to be a genocide, then take the time to share the show, foreignpolicyfocus.libsyn.com or the libertarianinstitute.org. We have the story on Sissy Mans. What this story was really about, I, I feel like for the most part, what overshadowed even the starving children in Yemen was the fact that the Sissy Mans crew was unable to reach Yemen. To any of us that uh, follow the news, and I've known for at least, I, I would say, two to two and a half years, I've known that journalists, uh, foreign journalists, have not been able to get into Yemen, and this has been a big deal. One of the few journalists that, who have gotten into Yemen, uh, one I know is Iona Craig. Uh, I, I know one journalist has smuggled themselves in. Those, they're, they've been very few and far between those who have been able to access Yemen as a foreign journalist. And, and so Sissy Men's catching on to this story two years later or so really should be a, hu- a huge failure in exposure of the failure of the media itself. That this is the first time that somebody in the mainstream has even attempted to go to Yemen to then get blocked by the uh, the Saudi government from entering is just absolutely astounding. And I, I feel like that that in itself could be the most important story here in any other thing that the media was ignoring seven million people starving to death by the United States hand certainly should be something that honest media is always up against and constantly talking about but in this case nobody even knows until uh, literally we're two and a half years into the saudi war so the i guess after you know trying for a while they were finally able to get permission from both the houthis and from saudi arabia to travel into yemen their plan was to fly to Djibouti and then take a boat over this seemed to be a surprise to them that they were even gonna have to go this is you know, through this step, maybe they were just so unaware of the war in Yemen that they were surprised that you just can't land at an airport in Sanaa. But that is the case in Yemen. And so, you know, they're forced, they go there, they take some pictures from across the water and you could see, I believe probably Aden or Hadaya or one kind of the port cities along the coast of Yemen from uh, the, the viewpoint they had in Djibouti. They then go to board the boat the next day to travel across, I'm guessing, to probably South Yemen where Saudis control and Saudi Arabia revoked their uh, ability to do so. This seemed to upset them quite a bit. I- I'm sure for a lot of these people, you know, on 60 Minutes, they're often not used to, de- you know, being denied access from a U.S. ally on these, uh, you know, human interests stories it would be one thing if yeah if the evil iranians or the russians or even the chinese were doing something like this but for a u.s ally to do it i'm sure was extremely shocking to them and so anyways they arrange it to where they're going to board a humanitarian aid flight and travel to yemen that way and what happened was is that saudi arabia then said they couldn't uh go on that flight either so now, as they point out several times in it, you know, the, the, they had all their, you know, uh, cameras and everything on the flight. And Saudi Arabia then says they can't go. Eventually, I guess the plane was able to take off without them on it. What they did do is they trained some of the aid workers to use some of their cameras and stuff. To bring back some footage, honestly, I, I mean, of the footage that's actually in the interview, there's nothing or in the little clip they do. It's a, like 13 minutes long in total, and a, a lot of the footage isn't even shot with, with those cameras that shot, you know, from uh, amateurs or just regular civil, civilians in Yemen. But like I said, for anybody who's been following the Yemen story, there's absolutely really nothing new in, in the content of, of the footage they got. The children that you see on that footage, it's hard to look at. And, you know, they kind of do the viewer discretion thing. But, you know, whenever you have a children that a child that's that malnourished, they're really is, is a really a different thing to look at. And I mean, no insult, you know, obviously to a three year old child who is starving to death because, you know, their parents are doing everything they can to get them food and there just is none. 
but that child is unpleasant to look at. Uh, when you see it, you're, you know, it's just really hard to see. And I'm sure a lot of it is because of that child is obviously suffering and in a lot of pain. I mean, to, to have that little food is extremely painful. And so, you know, for those of you who could bear to watch it, you know, I think it is important to see it, to see the results of what America's war in Yemen is doing, what the war, you know, Saudi Arabia's war that we're absolutely 100% supporting and allowing to happen, What what's going on there. Part of the piece, too, was an interview with whoever the UN food aid coordinator is. It's some ex-US governor. I'm sure he doesn't have any special expertise in distributing food aid or helping people out but he's got the job and he he only seems really interested in helping the Yemeni civilians he was very diplomatic in making sure that anytime he blamed anybody for anything he also blamed the Houthis although he was fairly critical of Saudi Arabia and what they're doing blocking the aid entering to the country which was important I was a little surprised at how maybe anti-Saudi Arabia this piece actually was and I guess I'll talk about that just because I, I think what upset them the most, even more than the starving children, was that they weren't allowed to enter Saudi Arabia. I kind of started to talk about this, but I just want to finish that discussion. That why, I guess, the, the entitled, entitlement of the, those people seems to bother me a little bit. But how they let that kind of overshadow the actual human catastrophe going on in Yemen really bothered me. I think there was an awful lot to discuss. There's an awful lot of war crimes going on. There's an awful lot of U.S. involvement. Of course, they don't even mention the U.S. involvement in the Saudi-led coalition there. And all that time that could have been spent talking about that was rather spent talking about, you know, Saudi Arabia didn't let us into the country. And it's certainly an important line that Saudi Arabia isn't allowing journalists into the country. But after two and a half years of this absolutely bloody, brutal blockade that has seen a million people now get cholera, millions of people starving to death, including children. I mean, we have saved the children estimating that 50,000 Yemeni children will be dead by the end of this year. Journalist Nasser Arabi estimates that that 50,000 people have died just in the conflict. Who knows how many people have starved to death in Yemen? And so for them to allow them not being allowed in the country to overshadow the the absolute plight of the Yemeni people bothered me a lot. Again, into the numbers, and I want to talk about this real quick, and just the complete dishonesty of what's been going on here. I think for 18 months, uh, I've been doing now the daily news roundups that you could check out at kylesfilesblog.com or the libertarianinstitute.org for about 18 months. And I think since I started that, I have been right at the beginning citing this 100,000 people having died in the conflict and this was a UN number. Now that was 18 months ago and that was hundreds of bombs dropped by Saudi Arabia ago. That was, you know, tens if not hundreds of battles ago. That, you know, U.S. drone strikes and raids have happened since then. And so if you can't just simply add up the people who have died in the high profile deaths to that 10,000 number, you're easily in the, you know, closer to 20,000 side. But it's a really dishonest way that they've been able to make this war not seem so bad. 10,000 people had died in the war. Yeah, 18 months ago, 10,000 people had died from either being shot to death or bombed to death. That didn't didn't include from the start all the children that were starving to death. That certainly doesn't include the children who have starved to death since then. Doesn't include the thousands who have died from cholera since then, and the thousands who have been you know shot or bombed since then. Right? Saudi or the the Sitzi men's crew did take time to document, not in a lot of detail, Saudi Arabia's bombing of the funeral home, which of course was one of the most disgusting things I've ever seen. We had uh maybe a hundred and fifty, two hundred people. Uh, hundreds injured in, in this bombing of a funeral home, not just with one, but with at least two airstrikes. Of course, the, the footage that Sitsi Mintz chose to show of this uh, airstrike wasn't quite as graphic or really as telling as some of the other footage. That's one thing I want to talk about, too, is I just felt like uh, that the, the footage they had wasn't all that great. And there's a lot of amateur footage out there of people who are just trying to expose what's going on in Yemen. And they use quite a bit of that in their uh, 13 minute clip there. And so... Th- I don't feel like 60 Minutes, other than just having a big name and putting them on your show, really did all that much to help out the Yemeni people. I've talked about most of my overall impressions uh, and tangents I went on in other parts of the uh, discussion. 
and I guess the, just the final thing I want to say and just highlight again is just how shot the city man's people were that this was going on, that all this happened, that Saudi Arabia blocked them from entering the country, that all these Yemeni people are starved. It's like this has been going on for two and a half years. So while it's certainly important for us to remind people of how, you know, dishonest the mainstream media is and everything like that, I think this is probably the best example that we have and why some of the other things may be a little bit more catchy. The fact that, you know, it's taking them two and a half years to discover seven million people starving to death in a war that could not go on with you without the United States is absolutely important. So let's update this, uh, you know, coup, but not a coup going on in Zimbabwe. One thing I've noticed is that nobody either in the international community or in the media is really using the word coup. So this, you know, really suggests to me that this probably has like kind of the general stamp of approval. It doesn't seem like any of the European powers, Russia, China, Saudi Arabia, and nobody that could really do a lot to mess this up is is at this point looking to get involved. I think the African Union is just hoping to not end up with millions of refugees in this process, and they're kind of hoping this ends up peaceful. But here's the situation. The army seems to, at least for all intents and purposes, really control things right now in Zimbabwe. President Mugabe uh, did originally say that he was going to step down, I think was even allowed to speak publicly with the uh, thought that he would be, you know, stepping down. However, he said that he was not going to step down. There have been massive protests against him from what I could tell. And this, like I said, it, it seems to me that the mainstream media and uh, the general European and American governments and world power governments don't seem like they're looking to take an, a side, the side of Mugabe or, Mugabe or anything like that. So there would be no exposure for anybody who was actually standing up for the guy. But it seems to me everybody is kind of on the side of getting this guy the hell out of power. I know that when the story had first broke, they had talked about the younger faction of the ruling party that Mugabe was uh, the, the head of was very supportive of him and his wife. But everybody else in the party was supportive of the former vice president who Mugabe had just fired. So the political leaders all, I believe, of all parties kind of came out and made speeches against him and saying, hey, man, just step down. Let's move on. Let's have our country move on from here. His own political party removed him as the head of the party. And like I said, uh, put the former vice president uh, now is in charge of the party. And it seemed he is at least heir apparent to the interim head of Zimbabwe. We now have, I guess, whatever congressional body that Zimbabwe has now starting impeachment proceedings against Mugabe. And they say that in a couple days, they'll be able to get him out of power. Who knows where things go from here? Like I said, it seems to me that there's not many people, if any, in Zimbabwe who want this guy to remain president. So unless there's just a very large anti, you know, impeachment movement that's being suppressed in the media and everything right now, but is, you know, growing louder actually on the streets of Zimbabwe, it looks like this may be a peaceful transition of power. I know over the weekend there was a lot of talk of the of leaders of other countries trying to let this guy kind of like go right off into the sunset and peace and say, yeah, your guy had to step down as president, but we'll do so for you to a lot of fanfare and excitement. And that way, you know, you don't start an uprising and maybe you can endorse the next guy to take your place. But it doesn't look like exactly that will happen. We have an interesting story involving the Palestinian Liberation Organization or the PLO and Donald Trump. Per existing agreement, the PLO has had a, 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 a office somewhere in D.C., and I don't know why this office is a big deal to them, but apparently it gives them some sort of legitimacy. I guess by whatever agreement the PLO office is in D.C., it's kind of not lived up to whatever the Palestinians were supposed to do to their part of the agreement, likely because they weren't able to or just couldn't because there was nobody to negotiate with on the other side. Or the other side's demands were, you know, go die in the sea, which, you know, really isn't a, a you know fair position to ask somebody to negotiate from. So Trump tells the Palestinians that unless they enter into serious negotiations with Israel, they are going to close the PLO office in D.C. The PLO said, you're not going to strong arm us and we'll close the office and uh, cut ties with the Trump administration. 
I think this does go to show again. I, I think there's been times where Trump's foreign policy in experience has uh, somewhat shown through. I don't think he had sped to the, the Palestinians to give him the middle finger and say, we'll close your office. So uh, let's see where the Palestinians go from this, where the Trump administration goes from this. It seems like there's so much else going on. The foreign policy stayed for Trump. It would be hard for him to even try to negotiate what's going on with Palestine here. However, Palestine is, of course, related to the whole alliances that have kind of formed in the Middle East with Palestine being on the opposite side of Israel, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, the United States, of course, Syria, Hezbollah, and Iran, uh, the Iraqi government now being on the other side. So while this could have larger geopolitical implications, I, you know, I mean, I don't, it doesn't look to me like the Israelis are looking for a fight right now. It doesn't look like the United States is really, you know, looking into entering into any more conflict. It seems like Israel has really been able to sell themselves into a nice pace of just stealing Palestinian land village by village. As I was documenting, probably last week, they had just, you know, taken another Palestinian village and, set, you know, put 300 Palestinians out of their homes. And so, you know, while the slow road is slow, they're not attracting any international attention. And I'm sure the Palestinian or the Israeli government and Netanyahu and the Likud party see that as an advantage. We have a story that United, more U.S. troops have died in war this year than in the previous two years. And this is the first time in six years the number of U.S. soldiers dying overseas has gone up. This year, 31. Last year, 28. Or 26. The year before, 28. Of course, there are still a few months left to go in this year, so that number could be even higher. But I think it does kind of go to show that of impacts of Trump's foreign policy, which is to put Americans closer and closer to the front lines. And like I have documented this as this podcast is that has unfold too, is that American troops are moving closer and closer to the front lines. And this should really come to no surprise to anybody who's listening to the show. More troops dying in the Middle East could create some more pressure on Trump to maybe, you know, withdraw or draw down these wars. I think Americans are tired of dying over there. And I think that's part of why, you know, Trump, the reason Trump won the presidency is that he was far less likely likely at least as candidate Trump to get your son or daughter killed in the Middle East. In Japan, we have a couple of stories. The first is I think a Japanese tugboat drifted into a USS ship. No sailors were injured this time, but this is the fifth time this year that a seventh fleet ship has taken damage from running into another ship. This one does seem a little different in that the tub boat actually ran into the USS ship. Although it seems, you know, I mean, like our ship should have been able to move. This seems avoidable. And just, you know, may go to show the larger problems that are going on in the Seventh Fleet. We also have a U.S. Marine. I think the Marine was probably stationed at Okinawa killing a elderly Japanese man in a drunk driving accident. The Okinawans have protested for years against the continued U.S. occupancy of uh, Okinawa with hundreds of Marines. And we also have a U.S. uh aircraft station there in Japan. And so I'm sure this will renew kind of the anti-U.S. Marine effort in Okinawa and expect to see some protests in the coming week. Also to see what happens to the Marine. I think if this was something that occurred in the United States, we would expect that soldier to, uh, you know, face justice under American law. Couple more interesting stories I want to touch on before I wrap up. First, we have Turkey pulling out of an exercise. Uh, I believe it was in Norway. Turkey said that the Norwegians, I guess, slighted them a couple times by making, by making Erdogan and then some other leader of Turkey targets in the war game exercise and this really upset the Turks, so they withdrew. I think it, you know, kind of is another fear that we're going to have this split between Turkey and the rest of NATO, remember, Turkey is the second largest army in NATO. And while I'm, you know, not somebody who's opposed to the breakup of NATO, it certainly has huge geopolitical implications, especially when you look at the possibility of Turkey then moving into the Russian orbit rather than remaining independent in the whole thing. The United States has, of course, made suggestions that Turkey maybe will have to leave NATO because Turkey is using Russian anti aircraft systems rather than using u.s made anti-aircraft systems so you know we'll see what happens here uh, lebanon and the prime minister so lebanon's prime minister harari did make it to france which was somewhat uh unexpected i think i was kind of surprised that he ended up going but kind of what i found out was that harari's two three children three youngest children two youngest sons and daughter uh remained behind in saudi arabia so 
what I had said last week was it seems odd to me that Saudi Arabia would let Harari leave because then they lose, lose all of his leverage over him. However, if you have his kids, you got the leverage. I mean, this is some Game of Thrones stuff going on in the Middle East right now. I know people say that this foreign policy stuff isn't super interesting, but man. Saudi Arabia has kidnapped the kids of uh, Lebanon's prime minister, and this is going to cause him to have to be compliant. Harari says he will return to Lebanon by some big Lebanon celebration day that I think occurs at the end of the week, so we'll see what happens there. I would, you know, possibilities would be maybe he endorses his brother to be the new prime minister, maybe he rescinds his uh resignation and you know kind of retakes up the role as Saudi Saab puppet as uh, prime minister of Lebanon but it, you know it'll be interesting to see how things move forward the last thing I want to say is that the Iraqi Kurds have stated their intentions I guess to live in a unified Iraq and if there was ever any speculation or hope that the Iraqi Kurds may achieve their own state this seems to be the absolute end to that bid at least in 2017 uh, you know, like kind of a formal omission from the uh, Kurdish regional government that they are no longer seeking independence. And so Iraq will at least for now stay Iraq. And, and you know, that's where I'm going to wrap up the show for today. Foreignpolicyfocus.libsyn.com, the Libertarian Institute.org, or the Facebook page, the Libertarian Institute. My uh, podcast is there along with several other great libertarian podcasts. We just added Trey Weaver's podcast to the group. Super excited to have him on board. And, uh, you know, they're putting out great content there. So if you're ever writing out a podcast to listen to and you haven't listened to every foreign policy focus, or you've already listened to every foreign policy focus, then check out those guys. I'm on Twitter at K-Y-A-A-A-L-E. Like I said, the private Facebook group, Foreign Policy Focus. Uh, I think that's all the plugs. So have a good day. I'll uh, be back on Wednesday.